the course taken by Amsterdam and Copenhagen has been incremental. And that is true. As far as I'm concerned, the people scale is the important scale of all of them. We have the city plan scale, the site plan scale and the people scale. And definitely the people scale where you touch the city and where you touch the buildings, that's what counts for quality. And we have here in Copenhagen. When I look at the area I've been working in, and who else has been working in this area for the last 40 years, I can count about 8, 10 uh, who have worked hard and have published and whatever. And I find it striking that the quality of the urban habitat of Homo sapiens is so weakly researched compared to the habitat of mountain gorillas and elephants and Beng uh, uh, what's called Bengal tigers and panda bears in China. Uh, it appears that every day you see all these programs in the television about uh, the tigers and the elephants and the love life of, of the lions and whatever. You hardly see anything about the behavior of man in his urban habitat and what's good for him. We all know about it, of course, so why study it? And because we all know about it, we forget about it all the time. And there are some blatant examples here in Copenhagen of places where they completely forgot what is good for Homo sapiens and went after what might be good for star architects, which is another story, completely other story. It, needn't, it doesn't have to be, but in many cases it is. Um, maybe I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. Um, in, in this new book of mine, which um, was, was finished last year and was supposed to contain everything I learned in 45 years of working in this area, um, I also look back at these 45, 50 years, uh, right back to the days of Jane Jacobs, and a little bit before that, when I think there was this very important shift of paradigm that instead of adding one house to the next in the existing cities based on, on experiences from, from many centuries, we've just built cities around the people and the human scale was observed and a lot of experience was taken over. Then 1960 about, we had two major events happening. One was that we were forced to build cities very fast or expand cities very fast and the other was the, the arrival of the big numbers of motor cars. And these two things together led to a fantastic change of paradigm uh, that suddenly instead of building cities from the people to the spaces to the buildings we started as planners to go up in aeroplanes and fly over and drop down objects and when it looked fine from up here, yeah. here we are, that's the fine composition. And then nobody was really detailed to make sure that it was a good city down here. So we started to be very obsessed with the objects. We always were as architects. And also the skyline may be more discussed than the people landscape. All this has started really in a bad way around 1960. I call it in this book the Brasilia syndrome, where it looks fine from the aeroplane and it may look fine from a helicopter looking at the singular objects, but down between the buildings it looks very bad. Nobody has given any thought to that and nobody was realizing that this was important. As far as I'm concerned, the people scale is the important scale of all of them. We have the city plan scale, the site plan scale and the people scale. And definitely the people scale where you touch the city and where you touch the buildings, that's what counts for quality. And we have here in Copenhagen a very interesting area down by the lakes, which looks, it's also mentioned here, it looks from the airplane, it looks very uh, boring and, and tedious and uh, 
from the helicopter rooftop, mm -hmm. not nothing to write post about, but down between the buildings, it's got all the qualities you can mention. And the interesting thing is about this area has the highest real estate value in Copenhagen and the highest concentration of architects in the country. They're living there, half of the professors and the mayor and the chief of plan, head of planning, they're all living there. Where the little scale is fine, but the other scales are not looked after really. And I would say that these people are so content enjoying life that they have no time to think about that it looks crap from an aeroplane. Um, that is not really the issue, but for many, many years we have gradually been drawn into thinking about the objects and thinking about the forms. Uh, this English um, architectural critic, Ken Warpole, he, he once explained it at, at a lecture and I thought it was pretty good. He said, it's bad luck for you architects that your mean of communication is the still photo and the two-dimensional drawing of, of section and plans and facades because and you constantly put these pictures on your magazines and you throw these pictures at each other. And in this way, you gradually, as a profession, is more and more obsessed with form. But good architecture, my friends, is not form. It's the interaction between life and form. So we have the life and we have the form and we have the crucial interaction, which is only good architecture if this interaction is successful. And then comes the bad thing is that life is very difficult to study. It's very difficult to research and, and the interaction has a number of complications to study what is good for the interaction, what is the influence of the built form to the, to the life in, in the area or in the city. And for these obvious reasons, form has been in the center of attention in all the architecture schools I ever come around and life has been almost forgotten and the interaction is something we don't talk about much. And that is exactly where I've been working uh, and that's a, that's a very uh, moving story about me being trained as a modernist and going about starting to do this and then lo and behold uh, just after I graduated I married a psychologist and had all these funny questions about why are architects not interested in people, uh, which was actually, is actually very true. And then, of course, that aroused the interest and then I have started to study this and the interaction. And I, my, my, my whole career has been down here and, and, and about this, where I've been pretty much alone, which is very good for a company like ours because we have no competitors almost worldwide, there are nobody else who do, as we do, um, look after the people scale with the background of 40 years of research. So we know more or less what we are talking about. I can tell you about my, our newest task, which I'm very proud and also humbled about, that is to assist the city of Christchurch in New Zealand with rebuilding after the earthquake. because. As they say, we are going to rebuild the city and we cannot just rebuild it. We must make the best city in the 21st century to keep people staying here, though the, it's rattling from time to time. So we must make all the buildings now earthquake proof and then we must provide the greatest city in the world for the next century. And that vision we have to come up with very fast because people were about to lose face in the place and businesses were moving to other places or immigrating, whatever. So I think that's a very, very wonderful, it's sad background, but a, but a very interesting challenge. What would be a very good city? And that would, by, that would be a city very much for people, as is also, I think, Copenhagen to a high degree. And, and that would be that a number of things have changed in a city like Christchurch. Uh, they have got a big university, they've got a very big population of students. 
They have a flat terrain. They have a good climate, like more or less like here. They have wide streets, and they use the streets for parking and for driving cars. And the first thing I would question in such a case is, would it be a smart thing to use street space for storing traffic means which are not used? Uh, maybe we could store them somewhere else and then use the street space for wider sidewalk, for bicycle tracks so the students can get around and also dedicated lanes for light rail, whatever. Um, and then some traffic, all right. But why use the whole thing? It's just it's just a compromise from the 20th century which, which we all drag around. And it's very difficult to get rid of it because it's given by God. But now in, in Christchurch, they have this rattling given by God and they have a completely tabula rasa. So they can actually rebuild their city to the visions rather than to the pressures of the motor car, which is about phasing out with the increasing prices of petrol and the dwindling resources, whatever. We'll have to do something smarter. Copenhagen, in my point of view is is famous um, and actually quite world famous because of um, its bicycle policy where they have now for 40 years done whatever they can to make it to invite people to bicycle more and they have firm plans to be the bicycle city number one in the world at this point 37 percent of everybody is going to work on bicycle and they have a plan inside 10 years to go up to 50% going to work on bicycle. And um, that's very good for the hills and that's very good for the climate and that's very good for the livability in the city. It's good for safety, it's good for attractive, attractiveness, attractivity in the city. Um, so the bicycle program in this city is quite something and that has transformed the city to increasingly more friendly city where you see people you know, bicyclists, they are sort of people. You can see them and they can see you. And if there are many bicycles in the city, in the street, there are many people in the street. And the other part of this program is the friendliness towards uh, pedestrians, which started in the city center 50 years ago when they started to close the first streets for cars for traffic and turn it into pedestrian streets and squares and gradually every year for 50 years they've, they've done a bit and recently they've started in the big way out in all the other districts by by widening sidewalks making squares um, also reducing traffic on all the streets which used to be four lane streets now they are nearly all of them two lane streets with median and bicycle lanes and street trees, much safer, much more attractive, and they can hold about, they can, modern traffic engineers can get as much capacity out of such a street, almost as much capacity as in the old days where everybody was struggling uh, over to get a room in the asphalt. Now it's more regulated. So, the city has become definitely much better for people day by day by day. For 50 years they worked on this. And now this is one of the first cities in the world who has a department for pedestrians and public spaces. Every city has a department for to make cars happy, you know. But none have so far had departments to make the people happy. This one city has. Also it's the first city where the um, where the way people use the public spaces and have been systematically documented since the 60s, which we have uh, documented in a number of publications, which again have had a tremendous influence on the city planning. As the mayor wrote to me when I retired from university, she said, if you guys in university had not collected all these data about the people we politicians would never have dared to make Copenhagen one of the finest cities for people in the world. So there has been a direct link between the interest in people and the policy towards caring and catering more for the people issue in city planning. 
So the transport engineers have got, have got uh, competition here. And actually, what has happened is that we've trained all the traffic engineers by now. Um, for many years, I always went out to the School of Traffic Engineering and gave them the works. Uh, and many of the modern traffic engineers, they are almost more green than you could think of. Uh, so whenever we go to Canada, we always start try to get some Danish traffic engineers with us. Actually, I did it once in Toronto. We couldn't get them to get make this than four lanes, but when we had the Dane, he could make it in two lanes. So there is also levels of expertise in traffic engineering. I do think that. Um, the course taken by Amsterdam and Copenhagen has been incremental and that has proved uh, to be very good for our mentality and whatever. If anybody at any time had unwheeled a master plan with all this in Copenhagen, they would have been thrown out of the town hall that same afternoon because people could not conceive the, the benefits in the long run. But doing it like this, and then gradually it became more and more friendly and uh, it became more and more. What is very interesting in Copenhagen is the fact that we have gradually learned not to, not to drive into the city because that's inconvenient. Um, we hard, my wife and I, we hardly do it ever. And we, we take the bikes or we take the metro or we take the bus. There are so many ways you can get here much smarter than driving in a car. So there's been a complete change of, of thinking and I think that will continue. There is in this city and many other cities rather big programs about gradually reducing the idea of having private uh, automobiles coming into city areas or central city areas. Um, I think that the automobile is great for going out in the mountains, but it's not great for going into a city. And increasingly in the big cities with the, and the fast growing cities, you can see it's completely nonsense. And go to Shanghai and you'll never come back because it's so infested with congestion and fumes and cars because they cannot and it's, it's impossible to solve accessibility with just letting more cars out or in. Uh, so I think that in a city like Copenhagen, we will continue to have a program of, as oil prices go up and oil resources go down, to have a program of shifting more and more movements from private movement into public transportation combined with especially bicycles. As you know, we can have the bicycles now on the trains that means uh, that you just go from your suburban home to the train station, put your bike in, go in and take it out and continue. That's for free. And uh, all, many people also have two bikes, one on either end, to, not to have the trouble to take it in and out of the train. Uh, so they have a very old bike at the train station here and a new bike back home uh, or whatever. So I do think that we'll see a further development and refinement of public transportation. And I think that is very much needed that we really, in the first, uh, in the next 10, 20 years, must see much better public transportation emerging, much better quality of transport and frequency and whatever, because that's the only way we can solve the, move, the mobility problems of the big cities of which we have more and more and most will be in Africa and in Asia and in South America. Um, and so say New York would be a little uh, uh, tiny little knot in this game when, when Chinese cities go from 20 to 30 to 40 millions. So that's where we have the problems and that can only be solved by good public transportation. I also can see this happen We've just got the metro here in 2000 um, and that's extremely popular and you should go and have a tour on the trip on the metro if you haven't. Um, 
the stations are la- are hailed as being very nicely done architecturally and uh, it's very fast it comes every three minutes around the clock 24 hours in the evening it's not so frequent but it's may six six minutes but it runs around and it's very fast and very popular in Melbourne they have made a plan about how to they know that they will grow from three to five six million in the next 20 years and they made a plan how to accommodate twice as many people without taking in extra land at all and also how they can improve all the suburbs by the new people coming in and that would be to build along the rail lines and along the tram lines and along the public bus lines to build five six seven story average density sort of step up the density towards the transport corridors and in this way they can double the population and that means that they can leave 20 percent of the suburbs untouched so you can just go on with your old unecological and unsustainable life in your little single family house and then yet you will have close by public transportation and services in these bands it is like a finger plan of Curitiba or Copenhagen where they would expand the city along the corridors and there will also be a number of corridors going the other way so you can go over here without going in here. So there are many interesting city planning ideas and transport ideas at large and we will, we will have to grasp, grab them. And my point is that when we do, we should always remember to observe the human dimension in whatever we do so that people get happier and happier the more we build. Instead of the more we build, they get more and more unhappy and hate architects even more than last year and previous year. Yeah, the whole idea, that I've heard many times in the last 20 years that now cyberspace will take over from public space. We don't need to do, we don't need to carry about, care about CD planning because now we have context in cyberspace, whatever. And all the time we've seen more and more uh, lively cities popping up and, 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 and good public spaces being made and people flocking there. And then of course, we have so much leisure time in our total life now that we have easily time to go on the internet and do whatever the digital stuff we would like to. And also, we have time to have holidays and enjoyment and also meeting people directly and using your own senses and sort of... And I do think that there is a, in, these, a link between the um, the um, digital or in, indirect context and the direct context that by seeing a lot of people on screens you feel more, more inspired to go and see something for yourself. Um, because it is interesting that all these in the cities have grown at the same time as all these in the, in the cyberspace. Um, so um, that's one thing. The other thing I do think, uh, and we have proved that in, in many of the uh, research pieces, that the ground floors are crucial for the functioning of cities. And I mentioned that, that we were in the old days, there was so much about the form of the building and the, I sometimes say that many architects, they are so obsessed with the form that their building starts to look like perfume bottles, where it's, for, it's all form. But what is really important is how this land in the city and how we talk to the spaces and talk to the other buildings. And that is certainly something which we have proved that the ground floor people produce the majority of all life in any area, whether it's shops or residences, whatever. The people in the ground floors are the one who is rushing in and out. That's where the... the um, interaction takes place, so that's crucial. And I, I, I do say in this new book that every school of architecture should have a department for ground floor architecture, because that's a, a, an art lost 
In the old days, you can see that there always was a differentiation in the buildings that they were richer down there and there, 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 there were more details and, and niches and holes and whatever. And then it got more meager upwards. Many times today you see the same facade rushing like a Norwegian mountain right into the fjord without any uh, uh, mitigation of that area. And as far as I'm concerned, I do think that that definitely what we should do today is to make wonderful cities for the people who move down here. And if we need more density, we can put it on top, but make sure it works down here. Some people call it the Vancouver model. I think that the Vancouver model is very interesting. I'm not sure that it's still refined sufficiently. I think it could be quite a bit better. And also I'm fearful that there are too many of this on top of it. Um, but the idea is right. Make it nice where you are and put the density on top. I also say sometimes that the tower is a lazy architect's answer to density. Because the same density you could also make carefully by put, making lower stuff and make sure the light can get in and the wind can go over and nobody is in, impinging on somebody else's privacy. It takes a bit of work and it's so much easier just to put it upside down. But um, also in this book I point out that the first five stories you can communicate with the ground floor, you're part of the city. And after the fifth floor, you're part of the air traffic control uh, authority. Because then you are up there, you cannot see the city, you're not part of the city. You can see them land out in the airport and you can see the mountains somewhere, but not the city. And that's about our senses and how far we can see and how our neck can be craned and whatever. And that's, that's very firm and that's part of the biological history of man. That's why we always built five-story stuff before. That's partly because we hadn't got the technology for elevators and partly because you could still be part of the city. And that was important in the old days. I, um, I will not comment about the situation in Seattle because that's not different from the situation in any of the New World cities. Maybe one could um, refer to one of the best transformations which have been made so far, which is Melbourne, which is a sheer miracle. What they have done and all the ideas they come up with and all the trams they put in and whatever. And um, I think that that many of the answers to your question could be found in Melbourne. And, and also, I have here, uh, I use here the phrase of parachuting the little scale into the, the big scale, because many times we will have to add new small structures in the big spaces to make smaller spaces which people can relate to. Could be gardens, could be pavilions, could be whatever, uh, but small scale which would make it interesting where you are while we are completely spoiled. As architects and planners, we make everything too big and too high and we've completely lost our sense of small scale. So that's why while you go to Seattle, my students will be going to Venice to study what a scale would be like if you were not confused by automobiles. And that's very interesting. The average width of streets in Venice is three meters. That's because they have many one meter streets. And then they have up to 10 or maybe even 11. Um, so, so as far as you're walking uh, and, and then small scales. And then if you have tight scales, then even a small widening is felt like a great event. But then the square would still be inside human scale. You can see from one end to the other. And still you feel this is a big square because you come through a narrow passage. And if you start with a street this wide and want to have a square, 
then you have to blow the scale completely and you can't see from one end to the other. It's not for you, it's for dinosaurs. So the scale problem is very crucial. And I would always advise people to try to scale places down. If in doubt, leave some meters out. And I have this reference to this professor of mine, who is a great per person, who said, if you expect um, 100 for a lecture, get an auditorium for 50. And then it will be filled before you start, and people will start to pile up in the corridor and realize that, oh, something must be going on here, which is important, because all of these people, they're all here, they're all here, for God's sake. And then they'll try to squeeze in, and they'll lie on the floor, and they'll hang from the lamps. And when you come in to give your lecture, everybody is very expectant, and this atmosphere is fine, and the distances are small when you come in, so you can have a really good lecture with these guys who are close by, very intense atmosphere. And uh, they will walk out from there saying, oh, that was fantastic, that was, a, you know, next time I'll have to be earlier to make sure to have a seat. And uh, the other situation is that you you, hire, you get the lecture hall for 300 and you have your, your 100 or 80 and they come in and say, where are the other ones? What else is going on? Is there something I haven't heard about? This still looks like the non-event of the year. And they will scatter all over the space. The space will be... And they will start to think maybe this lecture was not so great after all since there are so many of the other ones are not here. And then you will have big distances and every the expectation would be low from your side and from the the professor will also be less inspired by seeing these scattered for, uh, birds sitting there on the field so he said always whatever get people collected press them in and be close and be intense always make spaces smaller than you think you need. And that is also very important in city planning. And that conflicts right away with the automobile and their speed and their size. And then gradually we made the whole world so that the automobiles are happy and people are not. That's not so smart. Ta-da!